Welcome to the Parkview Life Podcast. I'm Chris Turner. And I'm Chris DeGeorge. We love God, love people, and desire to see generations disciple generations. Our goal is to inform, update, equip, and encourage. So what's going on today, Chris? Oh, not a lot, man. I think we're uh, rolling through first season of the Parkview Life podcast. It's been fun so far. A lot of topics we've addressed, and uh, we're also getting used to a schedule and those kind of things. We've had some some guests, and because of storms and other things, have had to, we had to reschedule and those things. So anyway, I think we're kind of getting a groove down with this. But uh, I think the bigger question is, have we moved the discussion forward any on what we call ourselves? Well, I... I... We haven't really decided, but I hear there's some uh, some interesting uh, ideas. Yeah, so I, I think the best one I've heard so far, um, and we'll you know keep the names private to protect the innocent. Um, but for you, Past Turner, and for me, Pastor, that might be one of the best ones I've heard so far. So I think we make an appeal to the congregation at this point to send in your suggestions. Well, that could be really interesting, uh, <laughs> you know. But hey. We'll see what happens, right? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, maybe we can get some clarity on this uh, soon, so right. we at least know what what to call each other. Throw so. them out there, and we'll uh, we'll check it out. Mm-hmm. So uh, we've got uh, Operation Christmas Child coming up here pretty soon. Tell the congregation what they need to do for that. Yeah, um, Operation Christmas Child, of course, is an effort by Samaritan's Purse that's been going on for many years. Of course, that's Franklin Graham's organization. Um, that takes Christmas boxes, it's a Christmas gift basically, and you pack a box and it goes overseas somewhere. Um, and um, it's an opportunity, I love the way that they do this, it's really easy to remember, they call them Go Boxes, which stands for Gospel Opportunity Boxes. Um, because when they get into a child's hands, it gives uh, their organization the opportunity to share the gospel with them. And um, what's incredible is, we even heard stories um, uh, you know, uh, just of people who even packing boxes up in trucks to go, you know, overseas that have come to know Jesus as a result of, of even just showing up to volunteer to help get those boxes ready to go. And so uh, it's a great organization, great way for us to be involved. And so um, our effort is between church and school, I think 900 boxes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so definitely a doable goal. And um, so, yeah. I think a great thing to do uh, is you pack one and encourage someone else to pack one or pack a n- numerous ones. Uh, we usually grab uh, one for each member of our family sure. and pack them that way. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just a great way to be involved. Great way to just get your kids involved as well in, um, in just recognizing uh, the need for the gospel across uh, to the nations. And so... Um, so yeah, we encourage everybody to be involved in that. Uh, November 18th, I think, is when we want to have all of our boxes here for, uh, but starting this Sunday, you'll be able to pick up a box, and um, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing all that God's going to do through that. So Right, and of course, you can turn them in any time before then, Yeah. But, uh, but that's a Wednesday, and that'll be the deadline so that we can get them where they need to go and uh, on to children all over the world. Absolutely. So there are some restrictions as far as the things you put in the boxes, but uh, each box should come with a little uh, description of that. If you want more information, you can go to Samaritan's Purse website, um, and uh, and you can find out all about that. So Yeah, great ministry. Excited yeah. to see what God's going to do this year. Absolutely, man. So what else are we talking about today? Yeah, well, you know, so we've been in this series uh, called Disciple Life, um, and, and we've been trying to accomplish two things through that is to look at our life as disciples of Jesus Christ and what's important for us to live out in our lives. Um, And then the reason that's so important is because we need it personally um, in our relationship with Jesus, but we also want to pass along something to the next generation. Um, So with that being our effort as a church, disciple life really encapsulates and encompasses all all of you know our living out of those things but then how you know we then pass that along to others by example and then uh, through intentionality uh, in giving them you know tools and resources and explaining the gospel and those things so um, one of the things I think is really um, neat about the way scripture kind of shows us this uh, and I think it's a thread that runs throughout it is the methodology of discipleship that we see because I think we often think about discipleship, and especially, I guess, in our Baptist context, we, we think about it as an hour of the week right. um, the on class. a Sunday evening. Yeah, yeah um, you know, traditionally in Baptist life, we had discipleship training or training union, it was called at one time, um, where we intentionally use that as an opportunity for discipleship. Um, and so, you know, 
I think the danger is that we would look at discipleship more of, of, of like a, a class that we come to or something. And it's not to say that those classes can't serve as opportunities for discipleship. But I think when we look at the Scripture and see what it tells us, is it's a, a lot bigger in scope. Um, it's not confined to an hour of the day. Right. Um, it's really an example that we set. And so, you know, looking at Jesus' method, I think, is one of the, you know, one of the ways we can do that. And then that method, I think, is seen throughout Scripture as well. So what exactly uh, do we see in his method? How do we know what we're supposed to do as an example? Yeah, so I think the, the picture that Jesus paints for us in how he did this, of course, we, we recognize like in Mark 1, um, the calling of the first disciples. Um, that's not to say that, you know, I think most would say that Jesus had interaction with his disciples before he actually called them to follow him, you know, where they kind of become apostles. Um, you know, so that calling out of them wasn't the first time Jesus ever saw them, but when he calls them out, their recognition and understanding, especially by his invitation, was that they were going to find out how to do ministry, you know, see what Jesus was going to teach them in the realm of following the Lord and those things. So, um, the, you know, we, we've talked already in the Disciple Life series, the invitation is the definition of discipleship, you know, follow me, I'll make you become fishers of men. And then, so Jesus gives that expectation, but then he, he brings them along with him. And so it, it wasn't that he said, hey, you know, follow me, you know, I'll make you become fishers of men. So we're going to get together for an hour um, every week and, and do this. You know, uh, one of the ways I've heard it said, Robin Galley has said this, is that discipleship happens best in circles, not, not in rows. Um, and so that's not to say that there aren't elements of discipleship that kind of happen that way. But when we get down into a circle, and that's really the picture of Jesus and his disciples, um, that Jesus walked with them through life. And so they were with Jesus when he prayed. They were w- with Jesus when he, you know, um, performed miracles. They were with Jesus when he just retreated for solitude. Um, they, they watched his emotion. They watched his manner of life. They watched all of those things. And so um, the picture of what Jesus does there is that he demonstrates to them just through life the the life that they were to live and how they were to accomplish ministry. So all of those things are seen kind of in the life that Jesus lives. And that's that's kind of the example of Deuteronomy 6. You know, that was the calling uh, to the Hebrews was just, hey, you know, you, you know you, you'll devote yourself to the Lord, you know, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, you know, then you walk through, you know, and this, you know, book of the law will be something that you teach to your children um, and, the, and the picture of it is when you walk by the way, when you sit down, when you stand, you know, so in all of these facets and areas of life, you're demonstrating to your children how they're to live. Um, and so Jesus kind of takes that and expands it into the realm of life of, of walking with these disciples. And so they would have expected to follow a rabbi. And so following Jesus, what he does is he demonstrates to them ministry, uh, walking with the Lord, presence with God. And all of those things are seen in his life just as they go through it together. Uh, So 12 men that he just surrounds himself with, he had an inner circle of of three, and they see some of the most incredible things that anybody could see because they were with Jesus. Um, And I think that's the picture, really, of what discipleship is supposed to be for us. Right. So as opposed to the hour or a couple of meetings a week, it's it's that all-encompassing, just being fully immersed in— learning and and following and watching and and seeing an example of of how they should live their lives. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, so that's not to say that, you know, we have to do it exactly like Jesus. And so we need to find 12 guys or ladies and, you know, bring them around us and walk your life with them. You know, I think, you know, it's going to look maybe a little bit different than that. But I think the demonstration of that example is that it's, it's so much more than just that one moment. It, it's meant to be more encompassing. And I think really what you see in Jesus is that he does life with them. You know, right. they walk through life with him. And so we need to, we need to be able to, to bring people in. And I think one of the dangers in our society and culture today is that we kind of keep people at arm's length. Um, we never allow anybody to know us. And, you know, by virtue of that, they don't know our struggles. They don't know the difficulties we have. Um, they don't know what we do when we struggle through sin and those kinds of things. And I think that's the you know, the danger in that. Um, As a parent, you know, I think we would sometimes feel inadequate because our our kids see everything about us. They see when we struggle. They see our highs and lows. 
Um, and so that's, that's the danger, I think, when you begin to expand it out beyond our families, that when we allow people into our lives, they also know the things we struggle with. You know, it, it's, it's easy if we're just doing this occasionally right. to put a front on and put a face on and, you know, we can kind of fake it through that even if we're, we're struggling through something. Um, when it's doing life together, you know, you don't, you, you can't do that. You know, people will see and understand. And so, and I think that's the intimidating part about this in some, in some yeah, so, respects. So what people. would you say to those that are seeking to disciple others that are overwhelmed and uh, maybe just have said even that I, I can't live that kind of life. That's just not possible. Yeah. So I think the first thing is to make sure that you don't expect that you're going to be perfect in it. Um, and that's the beauty of it. I mean, you know, the, the idea is not that we would live in perfection and that if we live in perfection, that's the only time that we demonstrate an example. I think David shows us that, you know, King David in Scripture. I mean, <clears throat> David is described as a man after God's own heart. And so with that, you know, the expectation might be sometimes that we would think, well, he's, he was perfect. You know, well, that certainly wasn't the case. Right. I mean, we, we see David struggle th- through some really, really major stuff, yeah. deep sin. So, I mean, adultery, murder, you know, we, we watch that, and then we he wonder. He wasn't always the greatest parent either. Right? No, absolutely not. No, he, you know, he— you know, we could almost even say he, he failed in, in a lot of regards as far as that goes. So, <clears throat> yet he's the man after God's own heart. Why is that? Well, I think that what we see in David's response to his sin demonstrates to us why he is. Uh, and it's that run to repentance um, and the trust and reliance on the Lord in the midst of that. Um, and so, for us, the picture that Scripture gives to us is not of perfection, but of one who should rely on grace. And so grace working out in our lives is what gives us strength to be able to walk through. We rejoice in sufferings, Romans 5 says, because of grace in our life. It's the grace of the Lord that brings us to justification, forgiveness of sin, salvation. Um, And so we rely on that grace. And so when we bring it into the realm of discipleship, what we're showing others is not perfection, but what we should be showing them is reliance upon grace. Right. Um, And so, and that, that sometimes is a difficult thing for us to do in our lives because you know, I think certainly in our American culture, sometimes we, we want to demonstrate this idea we have it all together, even when we don't. And it's okay sometimes not to have it together um, and for people to see that. But it's where we go when we're struggling through that that matters. And so as a disciple who wants to make disciples, what I need to demonstrate is when I failed, reliance on the Lord. It's okay for people to see my failures. Um, and, and in fact, in some cases, they need to see our failures. Um, but in a world where we've painted and kind of set ourselves as believers up to uh, even in some cases condemn others who have fallen short, that falls flat. Um, and so I'll just, let me throw this out there. A legalist is going to have trouble in this whole realm of discipleship because there are going to be times when they fail, but they're not going to want to acknowledge the times that they fail. Um, you know, and so when it's you know, strictly in that realm of if I've messed up, then you know, I don't want people to know it. Uh, they're going to struggle through that. And so I think in some cases, stepping back and recognizing that role of grace in our lives and an understanding, I need to run to the Lord in this and let others see that. Um, so now when we talk about Jesus' method, Jesus certainly was sinless. And so, but when we look at his disciples, the picture that we see is of restoration. So Peter, you know, I mean, Peter walked with Jesus. Um, we watch as he denies Jesus three times. But then at the end of John, what we see is the restoration of Peter. Then we move into Acts, and what we see is Peter standing in power on the day of Pentecost and preaching the gospel and thousands coming to know Christ through that that day. And so what it shows us is the power of reconciliation that the gospel brings and that grace demonstrates. And so we should demonstrate that in our lives as well. So, uh, so Chris, what about some other examples of those in Scripture that were discipling others? Yeah, so we certainly see it through the apostles, um, one of which being Paul. I think the beauty of that is uh, we, we looked at this in a sermon um, just a couple of weeks ago, you know, just in the reality that you know, mentoring disciples is, is the goal of, of what we want to do. Uh, so 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, um, you, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There's that, that grace again. Um, and what you've seen from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will teach others also. So Paul demonstrates this example of, of generational discipleship. Um, but Paul was the recipient of that as well. Um, and so, you know, we, we see in Acts, we see Barnabas take Paul under his wing and, and bring him with him as he's going to seek to minister. Um, so that's a beautiful picture of, you know, 
early on, I don't think Paul was trusted very much. You know, I mean, here you got a guy who, you know, easily could have been an operative um, seeking to take down the church, and that was certainly where he was. So the son of encouragement, Barnabas, taking him along with him. So that's a beautiful picture of that. And then, and then Paul, you know, demonstrating through his epistles, not just Timothy. I mean, certainly Timothy is the one we know uh, first and foremost. Uh, but we see Paul bringing these others on his journeys with him. I mean, Luke, who writes the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, was one of Paul's companions in his journeys. And so that picture of discipleship is seen in, in the reality of Paul just bringing people along with him to do ministry. And so and I think that's what's so effective in what Jesus did and then what Paul demonstrates to us is that you know Jesus started out by doing ministry and the disciples watching him. And then it moved into the realm of you know them participating with him. And then Jesus turned it over to they did ministry while he assisted them. And then he turns them loose and sends them out. And so you know, that's kind of the picture of an apprenticeship, if you will. And Paul was certainly effective at doing that. So in 2 Timothy, when we get to that, you know, Paul's at the end of his life, but he's reminding Timothy of all of the things that he's seen. And so there's multiple occasions where Paul encourages Timothy with, hey, you've seen my manner of life. You know, you've seen how I've lived. Keep doing that. But then he refers him back, as we looked at last week in 2 Timothy chapter 3, to, hey, you've relied on Scripture. You've known the Scripture from youth. Continue to walk in that because it's able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. And so, you know, that, that picture is evident in Barnabas and Paul, Paul and Timothy. It's evident in the disciples. We can see the, the evidence of it in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 6 and then even, you know, beyond that. And so that, that overall picture is certainly evident through, um, I think it's just a thread that runs through Scripture so that as we look at it, you know, we, we, we start to see this picture develop for us as we put all of these different pieces together. And even in the realm of uh, the book of Ephesians, as Paul writes there in Ephesians 4, that the role of, of pastors is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so really the picture that's set up with this is almost this, if you've got a person who's a believer here, the idea through the gathering of the church is that they would be exposed to and then incorporated into all of these different relationships, a pastor to them who's equipping them to do ministry, uh, relationships around them that are advancing their understanding of Scripture, advancing their ability to study Scripture, that then they're taking as they learn it and passing it on to others. It was that that was so effective at spreading you know, the gospel in the early uh, first century and beyond so that we're sitting here today and I just fear that in some cases we, we've lost an element of that. Um, you know, we rely on our, our structure and institution to spread the gospel and to maintain this generational discipleship when really the priority was put on individual Christians. And the church's role was to be the facilitator of that, um, which is why the church is so important. So we come together for worship and encouragement and teaching and training in God's Word so that we might unleash people with the power of the gospel and in the power of the gospel um, to go and, and make disciples, right? So it's that evangelism and discipleship, the oars of the boat that are working together. So, so what does that look like uh, going forward with the people of the church, the uh, kind of bringing it down from the top, uh, so yeah. to speak? Yeah, so I think when we look at the New Testament, if we want to try to achieve something like that, I think, again, it's, it's us first creating margin in our lives. Because I think the, the biggest thing, you know, so let, let, well, let me start with this. We want to get to the point where we have discipleship groups in our church. Now, it's probably not, it's not a perfect way of doing this um, because there's still going to be a time when you meet. But the intention is that you would be doing life together. You have relationships. Yeah, it's about relationship and it's structured around that in studying Scripture together, holding each other accountable, memorizing Scripture together you know, putting these pieces into place that help you thrive in the rest of life that you might then pass on to others. So in doing that, uh, what we're setting up is um, the idea that relationships are valued and important, and you have connection beyond just maybe a few small relationships in the church. And so this discipleship pathway um, becomes, you know, participation in a large worship gathering with the church together, um, participation, participation in a small group gathering where you're developing community with other uh, families in the church, and then in a discipleship group as well 
where that's a smaller group where you can have accountability. And, and the accountability aspect of that is, is a bigger piece. Most Christians lack accountability in their lives. So the disciples, when we go back to Jesus' example, they had definite accountability, right? So as they're walking through all of this, and a picture is Jesus asking them to pray. He says, hey, pray that you might not fall in temptation. He goes a little further. He prays. When he comes back, he finds them sleeping. And so, and he says, could you not watch with me for one right. hour, right? And so, so there's accountability in that because if Jesus would just turn them loose and said, okay, go and pray, we'll meet back together next week. Well, he may, I mean, certainly in his omniscience, he would have known that they weren't praying, but, you know, we might not have that ability. But, hey, if we're getting together and coming together and saying, hey, did you study the Bible this week? Uh, yes, no, you know, so that accountability is important in our life. And, and I think in the church, though, if we're not intentional about it, we, we lose out on that accountability. Well, because even in Sunday school, where there's not really an opportunity to ask those harder questions, and you're not really giving people permission in that group setting to ask that. And certainly in the large group gathering, it's not an appropriate place for us to start asking that question. Um, you know, we want to do it with people we trust and, and give people that opportunity in our lives and then pass that along to others. And so accountability becomes important. And so that, that discipleship pathway is meant to deepen accountability as we go in through these different groups um, and then bringing people into those and making them important and then intentionally walking through them in our lives. And so one of the things that people, I think, at, at Parkview certainly can expect is that, you know, this is going to take a little while. Um, you know, it's not a program, so there's not going to be a launch date where we say, hey, look, we have D groups right. now, and we want to build it slowly because I think the, the building of it slowly and making sure everyone understands, I think, leads to the success of this in the long term. Um, and so, you know, bringing people along with it and, and helping them understand it, getting them trained so that they might then bring others along into it is a process that takes, takes years. Um, and so we want to be committed along that line for years to see, you know, um, what the Lord's going to do in this and to make sure we're doing it faithfully. Um, and so I think everybody can expect that that will come along. And so that's what it looks like, I think, in our local expression of the church um, is having these groups, intentionally promoting them and talking about them and training people on, you know, what each group is meant to do. Um, and then, of course, that being the mechanism for discipleship that we use in our lives. Um, and the bigger piece of that then, too, is, is training parents how to disciple children. You know, um, how do we do this in our families? What does all of that look like? Um, and I think as a church, we can also do certain things to make that easier on our families uh, to be involved in all of these groups by having complementary Bible studies and those things that focus on the same scriptures and that kind of stuff. So there's a much bigger plan that we have in this. Um, that might overwhelm everyone if we try to talk about it all in right, one in right. one setting. But but I think that discipleship group is a way of looking at Jesus' method and beginning to put it into practice. And so um, discipleship groups, D groups, what we would call them, um, lots of resources available out there to talk about how we would do those. And um, and so I think that's what everybody can expect, kind of as we walk this out and and flesh it out in the days to come. Very good. So what would you say to the, the person that, that feels like they just, they're not there, uh, I want to get involved in this at some point when we start it, uh, but it's a little overwhelming and the commitments and I just don't know what to do with all that, uh, kind of maybe set their mind at ease as to, it's a day-by-day, step-by-step kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I think the first question to ask, you know, this last Sunday we looked at the Scripture, Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. Um, to recognize the prophet of Scripture in your life. Um, that's something individually that we need to be engaged in. And so a great place to start uh, is there. Everyone is going to feel some inadequacy as far as, as this goes. So I think creating margin in your life now for those things that are most important um, and recognizing the reason why they're important. It's not just reading the Bible to check a box off. It's reading the Bible so that it has value in your life. And so it may start with you saying, hey, I need to know how to study Scripture because I don't know I sit down and read the Bible and I get nothing out of it. And so, you know, we can give you resources um, that will help you with that. Um, and so um, I would say maybe um, three things. Uh, one, start by being faithful. Second, be available. And third, be teachable. Um, and so, you know, start with your own faith in Christ. Hey, how's, how's that looking? Am I walking in faith, to G- you know, with Jesus? 
Um, am I available? So meaning, do I have margin in my life to be available to be used by God? Um, so that's in my relationships, uh, family, church, everywhere. Um, am, am I available to Him? And then am I teachable? Am I humble enough to recognize where I may not have it all together uh, and then acknowledge that? Uh, and am I willing to find people that can help me grow in that? And so we've said this before. We'll say it again. Everyone needs a Paul and a Timothy in their life. Uh, and so, but a lot of times it's, it's those two second ones, being available to, to have time to have a Paul and to have a Timothy uh, and then being teachable that when we have a Paul to listen to what they say to us in our lives. Um, and, and to give them the freedom to say those things. Uh, and then make sure that they're a faithful person as well who understands what they're saying and talking about. Um, and because doctrine is important and, uh, and sound doctrine needs to be a part of our lives. And so I think starting with those three things, just ask those questions, am I faithful, am I available, and am I teachable? And then beginning to walk that forward. Great word. I know God's going to do great things here as we're just willing to submit ourselves to Him and seek His will. And so I'm excited to see what he's going to do. Yeah, amen, man. It's been another great episode here on the Parkview Life Podcast, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Awesome.